<clears throat> okay, hello everybody. It's not our last session. Uh, we have another session following, but it's the last session that is streamed. And we have a brilliant panel here, which I'm not facilitating. I'm just making a very short introduction, then Mark Leith will take over. Um, what I would like to say, um, first, I'm really grateful that we are here at this very nice place, Heinrich Böll Stiftung, and as a conference organizer, the best thing you can do if you just have to focus on the content, yeah? And you don't have to make sure whether uh, catering is working, whether streaming is working, and all this stuff. This is done so nicely by Heinrich Böll Stiftung, so that's the best way you could ever do a conference. So thank you so much for, for, for being <laughs> So the overall staff is really fantastic. So we're looking at this side as well, so it's, it's really good. And the other thing I would like to say is that um, the other fantastic thing is if you have an organizing team, which is just brilliant. So thank you to Pavlos. Uh, where's, where's the sitting, Pavlos? He's, I think he's, he's organizing other things in this very moment, yeah? <laughs> Ulash, of course, yes. Nicolas and Teresa. So um, that's the other great thing. Thank you so much. Okay, but I'm handing over. The floor's yours. Are we, are we on? We're on? We're on? What is this? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, good, all right, good. It's also picking up for the YouTube live stream, so hello, YouTube. All right, um, let's try and explain what we're trying to do here, which is something a little different. Uh, when the conference has been organized, this slot was originally for Isabella and I to talk about her book on China, which is a brilliant book and definitely worth discussing, but it is not exactly on topic for the Central Bank Conference. So we then decided let's pivot and turn that into a conversation about the topic du jour, which of course is inflation. And then we thought, well, it's just the two of us banging on about inflation, really, isn't that interesting? So perhaps we should ask some other people. So we thought we would ask Nicola and we'd ask Lee. And this allows me to then do what I should do, which is all 50-year-old white guys should shut the f up and actually listen to young people for a change. And that's what we're going to do, because you heard plenty from me the other day. So all I'm going to do is ask questions and facilitate. The idea here is we're going to do probably two, three rounds just to get it going on some questions. And then you all join in. And that's it, and we have a conversation until we collectively go, we're done. So that's it. Think of it more of a chat show than an academic event. So with that in mind. Okay, so I'd like to start off with where did all this inflation come from? So Nick, for a bit of background, had a, a, a bit of background in his own background, used to be a central banker. Ooh. And therefore, I thought it'd be appropriate to ask him something about that. Uh, then we're going to go to Lee. Lee is the only political theorist I know who is also a first-class political economist. So I thought I'd ask her something that may be pertaining to her skill set. And then finally to Isabella. Isabella, as you of course know, uh, has uh, the distinction of being the one person in this room who has been beaten up on Twitter more than anyone else for daring to suggest that something other than interest rates may be a cure-all, if not a cure-all, a cure-all, a cure-sum for inflation. So maybe we can get a little bit into that. So, oh yes, let's quote, quote, yes, you're not a real economist. That's right, of course, yes, right. Well, you know, that's fine. All right, so Nick, uh, remember central bank porcupine charts? The ones where the inflation forecast would go like this and it would never happen and it kept going down the trend. So you worked in the Bank of England, you've been in the ECB. The problem we were facing forever was deflation. And it seemed that sort of cognitively these institutions were coming round to kind of accepting that reality. And then, whoa, inflation's back. So is this, do you then expect that to basically result in a return to orthodoxy? Or do you think that the new thinking that we were involved in prior to this inflationary period is going to have a lasting impact? How do you see it playing out? So thanks. Can you hear me? OK. Thanks, uh, thanks Mark. Uh, thanks also for everyone for being here. Um, I don't know if my answer is actually going to sound like a central banker answer. Like, I'm also an academic right now, so I'm going to uh, combine, uh, combine the two. So I think that um, when we observe what, what is happening now, um, 
I think like what is what is really interesting in the current uh, in the current inflation debate is actually to look at the, at the drivers, no? And uh, and like what is, what is actually making us turn from this uh, deflationary period, from this very low inflation uh, uh, period that we went through, to a very high inflationary period, this very high inflationary regime. And what is, what is interesting is that while I see that there is a lot of consensus among uh, different observers, both in central banks but also scholars, on what the drivers of inflation are, then there are all these different narratives that are emerging. And it's really difficult to say who is right uh, and, uh, and, uh, and which, which narrative is actually, is actually the, the one that we, that, we should, uh, that we should follow. Also because I have the impression that all of these narratives are pointing to different, uh, to different solutions. So it seems like that we are not really explaining inflation because we want to really understand what it is, but we want to understand what's the right policy, policy response that comes out of that. And I see uh, four main narratives that are, that are emerging right now, and they seem to be dependent mostly on uh, on who, who is talking about it and probably some underlying ideas. And indeed, that connects to, the, to your question about the orthodoxy. And so real, really briefly, uh, what are these four narratives and, how, and which ideas do they, do they, do they, are they supporting? So one narrative is the idea that we're living this inflation period because of a fiscal stimulus that was too large. And this is a narrative that uh, Republicans in the US in particular like a lot. And, uh, and it's based on the idea that the stimulus was too large uh, compared to what we needed, and now we have uh, an inflation uh, that, uh, that is deriving from the fact that we created too much money that are chasing too few goods. Uh, however, this narrative doesn't seem to work when we, when we think about inflation right now because it doesn't explain global inflation, it's very US, uh, US related, and also it's really weird to think that this stimulus can actually explain a persistent path in inflation because this stimulus was indeed a one-off uh, policy with different rounds, of course, but it's really difficult to think that this could be the case. Uh, then there is another narrative that is, uh, that is saying that the reason, the problem is that unemployment uh, is too low, especially compared to the natural rate of unemployment. This is the Larry Summers uh, uh, group. But this idea... Huh? That, that, that employment, they, it's like, so the problem is to, to be found in the labor market. Uh, and, the, and the idea is that wages can still have the same effect on inflation, can put the same pressure that they would in the 70s. So here the idea is indeed based on orthodox ideas, but also historical experience. But when we look at the data, inflation is not really, does not really look like the one that we were experiencing in the 70s and in the 80s. Of course, it's coming from supply side shocks, but it's not really the same. It's not as broad based as it was, as it was in the past. So there are problems also related to this narrative. Then there is Krugman that replied to that by saying, uh, uh, this is not the case. We don't really need a crisis. We, not, we don't really need a, a, a high rate that is going to generate a, a crisis. And also, this, I think this idea of the crisis is something that Mark and I discussed a lot with each other. It's like this idea that to, go, to get out of a crisis, we need to suffer, a bit like in the, in the austerity debate in the previous crisis. And so it doesn't match with the data because inflation expectations are, are too anchored. Then there is a, a, a fourth narrative that argues that indeed the problem is in, uh, in price gouging. So firms are taking advantage of this rise in inflation and they're charging uh, uh, prices that are too, that are too high. Uh, while it makes sense in theory, I think it's, uh, it's really difficult to, to find uh, evidence in the data. You see that in, in, uh, the inflation is increasing, profits are increasing, but it's, it's difficult to say that it's because of firms uh, uh, charging too higher prices. So I think that there are different narratives that provide uh, uh, different solutions that are based on different ideas. And, uh, and this is like, this makes it very difficult to take, to take a position in this debate. All right, so we have these four different narratives kicking around. I want to take two of them and give them to the American on the panel um, because they're particularly germane. So blame the workers, never tax corporations. Why is it that the Americans in particular have a complete third rail approach to even talking about the notion that it's anything other than the labor market? Yeah, great. Great question. Um, I think, I mean, to the sort of, I think the, the, the concept around the wage price spiral, right, and blaming inflation primarily there, the thing I think is not discussed enough is 
why, why is it that we focus so much on wages, um, and in particular on wages rising as it relates to inflation and not profits, which we, of course, hear about all the time in our circles, and there's all this evidence that they're rising? And I think the answer really is simple, right? For wages to rise, workers have to ask for their wages to rise, right? And often when they ask for those wages to rise, there's, they, their employers say no, and then it becomes a very public political battle. And so it's, it's, there's this obvious power distribution where prices can rise and profit margins can rise without any public discussion, but wage rises have to come with a request, a very public request, particularly in a moment, right, currently in a, the inflationary moment where everyone's saying, yikes, everything's falling apart, we couldn't possibly allow this to happen because it's going to cause more problems, despite the fact that the meager wage rises I think that we've seen have been nothing more than catch up rather than actually driving the core issue. So I would say largely that's a political power problem. So just before moving on to Isabella, just, just a thought on that one. There's a Resolution Foundation report that came out in the UK last week that got quite a lot of press in which Torsten Bell, whose work I greatly admire, puts at the middle of all of this the link between pay and productivity and concludes that because uh, growth has been so low, Wages have been so low. Now, that's a really interesting move because what that does is presume that pay and productivity are automatically linked and that if employers get productivity gains, it's automatically shared with workers. And that really isn't the world that we live in, and yet we seem to assume that. And a wage price spiral also assumes that, but it's clearly not the case. Isabella, let's talk about the 1970s because that's the, a metaphor du jour for all this stuff. Why is it you think that, why, would you, why do you think that uh, uh, the macroeconomists that sort of set the agenda are, are so invested in taking us back to that period to understand this period? Is this working? Yes. Um, let me start by saying um, it's quite remarkable if you have studied for so many years, done two PhDs, and the most amazing thing about yourself is that you have been in, cited on Twitter by Paul Kirkman. Well, <laughs> I'm also an unreal economist of some sort, um, so let me try to um, speak to inflation from the perspective of someone who is working on inflation and price stability from a historical perspective. In many ways, How China Escaped Shock Therapy is a book about price controls and when they worked and when they did not work, and is a book about the challenges of inflation in moments of transition, in moments in which the basic structures of an economy are changing, and that cre creates issues with the real economy. And this, these issues with the real economy are then linked back into the monetary sphere in ways that are often rather unpredictable and difficult to understand as we are living through these transitions. I want to use three historical examples where, yes, the 1970s is one of them. <laughs> But the first one I want to refer to is the one that I did invoke in my Guardian piece. This was not invented by me, however, but by the Council of Economic Advisors, um, advising the Biden administration, that there's a parallel between the post-shutdown inflation and the inflation that happened in the transition from a war economy to a post-war economy. That parallel results from the fact that if you have retooling factories from producing tanks to producing cars, you have bottlenecks. You have bottlenecks in your supply chain. You have delays in the elasticity of supply to respond to demand. Now, 2021, probably the most important word in the economics discourse has been bottlenecks and supply chain issues. So we are back to a word of supply chain issues of inelasticities and strong demand. In that kind of word, people like Paul Samuelson, Irving Fisher, Paul Sweezy, and John Kenneth Galbraith agreed, which is a rather unusual thing to happen in the history of economic thinking, that um, in that kind of situation, you get windfall profits because firms can charge higher prices thanks to strong demand and inelasticity of supply. And then this kind of situation, selective price controls might be of some use. Yes, Irving Fisher did sign that letter, and he's known as the most conservative monetary theorist of the 20th century, possibly. Okay, so this is happening in the 2020 post-shutdown economy. Now, superimposed on that, you have an oil shock that is similar to the 1970s. This is where the 1970s meet 2021, especially the second half of 21. This is an, a shock that is not only in oil, as a matter of fact, but also in food. And this is an interpretation of the 1970s that is an interpretation of blinder rather than the settled history of the 1970s being about um, too much aggregate um, demand and so on. 
Now, fast forward to the spring 2022, I would argue, that superimposed on an inflationary dynamic that is in parallel with the post-war inflation, and an inflationary dynamic that more or less mimics the oil and food price shock of the 1970s, we get something that looks more and more like shock therapy as we have encountered it in the transition from socialist economies. One of the key elements of shock therapy was that prices in the most upstream, most essential, most systemically significant sectors were being liberalized, which resulted to shocks at the heart of the industrial system that rippled through the whole system. And in the case of some countries that went through shock therapy, literally pulled apart the whole economy. I am afraid that Germany might be sleepwalking into a similar kind of situation in relationship to the gas shortages and the gas price explosions that we are observing. And I do think that the history of transitions, of previous transitions, from war to post-war and from planned to non-planned or less planned or chaotic kind of economies um, does um, hold important, do hold important lessons for understanding where we are now. So we have a set of conflicting narratives of which there is no real truth. Very Pomo of me. Uh, then we have multiple historical episodes that we seem to want to jump on because they prove at one point rather than another. And there's a certain politics to that. And I'll go back to Lee for a minute. Why is it then that despite all of that, do you think that we always end up coming back to one policy tool or solution, which is interest rates? What is it about that that becomes the lodestone despite all of these other ways things could be done? I think this is a great question, and it's the thing that I've really taken away the most from the recent inflation uh, incident, which is we have this inflation um, that is at least in part, if not primarily, driven by bottlenecks, supply side issues coming from these geopolitical events. And we have central banks that are trying to address the issue of inflation, but they feel, at, at least, that their options are extremely limited, right? Looser or tighter monetary policy. Uh, and they're attempting, right, to realign aggregate supply and aggregate demand, but because they feel as though they can do nothing with their tools about the bottlenecks that are causing the restricted, the inelastic supply, their only option, right, is to bring demand down, right? Hence the obsession with the soft landing, because if we have to bring demand down, we want to do it as softly as possible so as to not go too far and cause recession. And meanwhile, these central bankers are also often looking at the fiscal authorities saying, please, 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 can you do something about the supply side issues so that we could actually have the option of bringing the supply back up to meet demand rather than having to bring demand down to meet supply. We can't possibly do that with our tools. Please, can you do something? But then, of course, you have the legislators looking at the central banks and going, us do something about inflation? Are you kidding? Like, this is the whole setup, right? You have central bank independence, you take care of inflation, and we get to worry about other things. So we end up with this situation where nobody has both the responsibility and the capacity to act to address the issue in the most obvious and efficient manner. And so we end up with this perverse situation that I think, for me, is quite revealing of an underlying issue, which is that the governance regime that we've got with the relationship between the legislature and the central bank is actually curtailing state capacity, right? Because the state has the ability to address these things in a very direct way with things like price controls, as Isabella has mentioned, also credit guidance and credit controls. And yet, because we have delegated monetary policy making powers to this independent central bank and simultaneously want to maintain this veneer of democratic accountability and, and um, legitimacy, we delegate those matters and yet we curtail their powers, right? So they're very narrow. So the idea is, yes, you can do um, monetary policy, but you only have a few powers, but then the legislature feels that's not my zone of interest. So even though in theory I could in, in, you know, use price controls to address the issue, I don't address inflation. That's not, my, that's not my thing. And so we end up having this curtailing of state capacity, and it's biting us, I think, at the moment. And I think we need to revisit it. Building on that, Isabella, let's go back to China. If, if Lee is correct, is it the case that we see lower inflation in China because they have just much greater state capacity and also a different, if you will, cognitive framework for dealing with it, given those instruments? 
Yeah, um, this actually goes back to a point that I'm arguing in the book, um, in the sense that one of the key lessons from the experience of the 1980s is that there are sectors that are essential, and there are sectors that are non-essential, and these have to be regulated in different ways. And in essential sectors, the state in China um, has the capacity to directly participate in the market. So you have a situation where you don't have an opposition of state and market, or the only ability of the state to regulate and, and, and guide certain sectors through regulation or legislation or through direct planning, but rather where you have institutions that have the capacity, knowledge, and on-the-ground ability to actually participate in specific sectors. So there's a completely different starting point there. But I think that the question of why China is experiencing very low, almost too low inflation, and yes, not 2000s Chinese-style explosive growth, but still relatively stable growth, and basically all of the rest of the um, world is in a situation that can be characterized, I think, by unprecedented levels of inflation and being at the brink of a recession, that this is in fact the most important macroeconomic question that we will be facing in the next years, since this is elevator up and elevator down in terms of macroeconomic dynamics. Why is that so? I think that the first key point here is the different trajectories of the pandemic, where China has been on a completely different timeline in terms of the ways in which the pandemic has played out. This has resulted in a situation where China in 2021 has basically tried to safeguard its economy, tried to put down all the sources of economic instability with often very harsh measures, such as in the case of the real estate sector, which means that all the places where things could easily go wrong, all the bubbles that were already built up were tried to be deflated in as controlled a, a, a way as possible. This also meant that China, unlike the rest of the, um, of the rich um, economies in the world, did not engage in large-scale fiscal spending in 2020 and 2021. So as such, I would say that China has been on a deeply counter-cyclical kind of trajectory, counter-cyclically not to itself, but counter-cyclically to the world, which means that they could use the stimulus that has been issued elsewhere to basically help them get through the first years of the pandemic. And they are now in a position where they're actually lowering interest rates and creating fiscal stimulus, thus being in a situation that is macroeconomically, I think, pointing to a much, much brighter outlook than what we are seeing elsewhere. Thank you. Nick, I believe you're a European. So let's think about Europe. Um, I don't want to use the inherently dodgy concept of fiscal space because that relies on even more dodgy concepts of output gaps. But let's talk about different countries. If you're Italian and there's global inflation, that solvency equation starts to look pretty nasty. Uh, that's a real problem. It's a problem for all of Europe. If you're Germany, part of the attraction for the euro has been the fact that you've had an undervalued exchange rate with low interest rates so you can power ahead as an export powerhouse. Now that you've had a supply shock to critical energy and you've got an undervalued exchange rate, you're paying ever more and you're adding to inflation, which is destroying your cost competitiveness and is threatening that basic model. And if you're British, to include them in Europe for argument's sake at least, uh, if you're British, the analogy of the 70s is probably 1976 in the sense that you've been running a huge current account deficit forever on the promise that for some reason sterling's more valuable than it obviously is. And uh, they may be finally calling time on that, and that's very much back to kind of like a currency crisis model given inflation through the import channel. So my question to you is, if you were sort of surveying how inflation is impacting different European countries, how, if you, and you had to sort of give anyone sort of policy advice, where would you be the most worried who do you think is going to have it easier? How do you think it's going to play out over, let's say, the next two to five years? Where would you be most worried about, least worried about? Okay, that's a hard question. Um, I think what I would do is, is indeed not try to, to predict the future pattern because uh, connected to, to the questions that you asked before and, and, my, and my answer, I, I think it's really hard sometimes to, to really predict uh, what is going to be. But if I think about 
indeed also connected to all this discussion we had on state capacity and what, what really states can do when, uh, when uh, the main tool, uh, at least according to economic theory, one of the main tools is monetary policy, and we know that monetary policy is not controlled by governments. Even more in Europe, where we have a single central bank that affects all these different uh, economies, and we know that sometimes, most of the times, one policy doesn't fit all. So what, is, what are the tools that are in the hands of, uh, of European governments? Uh, I see two tools mainly. Um, I'm simplifying, but those, are, those could be two tools that, are, that would be interesting. One is uh, fiscal policy, of course, and the other one is, uh, is regulation that takes the form uh, of what we say, like price control. So in terms of, uh, of fiscal policy, you could, uh, depending on, on, the, on the status of your economy, you can decide to indeed make, uh, engage in, uh, in austerity, in a more contractionary fiscal policy, because you think inflation is too high and the central bank is not doing enough, so that could be a standard a standard response to that, or you could do actually the opposite. You think that uh, higher interest rates are damaging too much your economy, and so you want to protect certain, uh, certain sectors of the economy, and with fiscal policy you can target those sectors and, uh, and try to mitigate the, the, the side effects of higher, of higher rates. And it's interesting because this policy seems to be what uh, Spain is thinking about. There was this news yesterday of the Spanish prime minister that said, we are going to put a windfall tax on, uh, on banks, uh, on uh, uh, energy companies, because we know that they're going to gain from uh, higher rates. Uh, banks immediately said that's not true because we don't know yet what is going to be, this, uh, how, how, how big this, uh, this, uh, this interest rate will be, this interest rate, right? And, uh, uh, but this could be interesting because indeed like the, the idea there is to tax banks, to tax uh, uh, energy utilities companies, to use then the revenues for other projects. In particular, they mentioned, I don't know uh, how far they will go in that, into that, but they mentioned, for example, scholarships uh, for, uh, for younger generations uh, or uh, building infrastructures. So that fiscal policy is one, uh, is, one, is one option. It could have, of course, distributional effects because we know already that inflation is distributional as well. And uh, the other option could be uh, price control, indeed something that comes up again. And here the case is interesting because there is already an example in, in, the, in the EU, not in the euro area, which is Hungary. So Orban put price control on a certain basket of goods, and uh, uh, mainly goods related like food, mainly uh, a basket of, uh, of goods related to food, but also uh, a cap on, uh, on fuel prices. And, uh, and so there are, there are these options, and, they're, and they, are, they are doable. I'm not saying that these are the solutions. I'm not saying that uh, uh, price control could be, for example, the solution here. My honest opinion, but of course it depends on the, on the country, would be that fiscal policy, maybe it's, uh, it's, more, uh, it's a better instrument because you can better target uh, a certain sector of the society. The only thing that we should worry about, and here I'm being a bit more the economist rather than the political scientist, is that both these, uh, these examples could be driven by uh, electoral concerns as well. So we have to be a bit uh, uh, worried about that as well, because uh, Orban did it and uh, imposed this temporary cap as elections uh, in Hungary were coming, national elections were coming, and he extended it uh, with the objective of having this cap uh, still uh, in presence uh, when, uh, when the elections were coming, whereas Sanchez did it uh, after uh, a bad defeat uh, in Andalusia, in the elections in Andalusia. So of course these are things that need to be taken into consideration. I don't agree with uh, the media that immediately jumped and called them both populist in this case. I mean, Orban can be populist also for other reasons, but I think that could be something to keep in mind. And magically, we reached 45 minutes. Let's open it up to everybody else. Questions? I believe the first one is Mr. Greeley, followed by the gentleman at the back. Someone give that man who's standing up a microphone. It's a question for, for anyone on the panel, which is um, when we talk about the, uh, the response to COVID, everything that you mentioned that was done was done as if we'd all agreed that an emergency button had been pushed. Fed was incredibly creative, looked at all the credit aggregates, went out to rescue all of them. Direct checks to people, like that's insane. That had it was not, these are not things we normally do and there was a recognition that these were not normal times. Why can we not push the emergency button now again and be that creative again? I'm the 50-year-old white guy. I'm saying nothing. I'm saying nothing. 
Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, first of all, I think, yes, all the buttons were pushed when the pandemic hit, but they were all monetary buttons, buttons for which you had buttons to be pushed if you want so, right? Right now, we are in a situation where you would need to have buttons to, that push very specific sectors, often not even sectors, but subsectors, very specific kind of real economic issues where you would need to have capacity to react to this. The supply chain task force that was constituted by President Biden did try to go in that direction, but I think it didn't go far enough. It would have had to have much, much more um, power. It would have had to have much, much more um, resources and would have had to be able to um, really, really um, take action rather than um, just, just call for conversations type of thing. Um, so I think this is one key point. I think another point is that um, we are kind of living in denial in some sense um, to just how severe the crisis is that we are living through. We are in a situation of overlapping emergencies, I would argue. We have the pandemic, we have climate change, extreme weather events that hit specific sectors in very specific ways where you have to be able to react to these specific sectors because interest rates up or down by 0.5% is not going to bring your crop back after um, it has dried out, right? <laughs> and so on. Um, we have the war. Um, we have a situation where I think um, we are trying to fight an economic um, meltdown that is structured by emergencies that are highly sectoral and highly specific in their real content with tools that are aggregate macro tools. And this goes back to a question that we didn't get to discuss, which is what are the ideas that underpin the ways in which we have been discussing inflation? And I think one of the key ideas that, in fact, I would argue, um, unites many monetarists and Keynesians is that inflation at the end of the day is a macroeconomic kind of phenomenon. And all of our institutions have been set up to respond to inflation as a macroeconomic kind of phenomenon. Now you're basically trying to um, be a cyclist, drive a car or something, right? Or maybe someone who cannot bike, uh, try to get to a train station quickly um, uh, with a bike type of situation. Yeah, I, I just jump in with two thoughts. One, just to... Uh, extend that point. Some of us talked about this in the, in the um, breakout sessions yesterday, but right, I mean, there's this background assumption to the overarching approach that there's efficient credit allocation in the economy. And that's what allows us to focus on just, do we need too much, too more, more money or less money, right? Because otherwise you have to consider the, the, the possibility that there's too much here and too little here, and we need to focus on getting money and credit and support to specific sectors. So there's definitely like an ideological thing going on there. But to your other point about, you know, why can't we just push these buttons all the time? I mean, I think Isabella's point about which buttons and do the proper buttons exist is a huge point because it's all about infrastructure. I mean, we talked about this a bit in uh, Catanina's talk, right, at the very beginning, right? It's all about the infrastructure. Currently, the monetary infrastructure runs through the private financial system. So the moment the US government says, oh, why don't we send money to everyone? It's like, oh, how do we do that? And that's crazy. Um, and, and so the we would have to build the levers, build the buttons in order to sort of do things more broadly with any consistency and success. I mean, hence the fact that all of these, the municipal bond facility, the Main Street facilities have just withered away insofar as they are even successful at all in the first place. And so that's one thing. And then I think the, the political point on the back of that is if you start to build the, that infrastructure, this idea of monetary policy being an apolitical technical matter just completely is blown up. Right? You can't have an infrastructure to make political decisions like who to send money directly to in their bank account and suppose that Jay Powell should be the one deciding that exclusively and still call your system a democracy. So I think that's the problem. I believe there's a microphone over there. Uh, thanks. Um, I got a question. I think in Switzerland the inflation rate is slightly lower and prices are some kind, it's a more regulated economy, I think. Uh, maybe you can dig into this, Isabella? Yes, for those who speak German, there's this wonderful institution called the Preisüberwache in Switzerland, which is something that I would want to research, but have not really researched yet. Anyways, um, it translates in English into the 
price surveyor or controller, I would say. So basically, there is an institution that is legitimized by the argument that there are situations in which the market fails to perform its controlling function, which is through competition to ensure that prices don't explode. If the market fails to control prices, then you need a political entity that can step in and make sure that in a situation of a lack of control through the market, um, the, the, this, uh, these companies that can benefit from this do not, um, are not enabled to abuse um, their power um, due to the lack of the control of competition. I think this argument um, makes some sense. <laughs> How exactly this institution works um, I'm still trying to understand, just to be perfectly honest here. I also think that the Swiss case is a very special one. I mean, you have a, a, an economy that has um, a very, very strong currency, so the whole international sector is much, much more important than um, for most other economies. You ha also have often um, very specific price policies that are there to basically um, protect um, Swiss farmers and Swiss producers. So this is basically an upward price control, if you want so. It's basically shielding these producers from the international market to ensure that Switzerland continues to be able to um, produce stuff that people need for daily survival. So in that sense, I think it's a very interesting case. I don't think it's um, the case that can necessarily deliver the lessons for a country like Germany. Let me add one sentence on price control, since I didn't have a chance really to speak to that. Um, I think it's important to see what price controls can and cannot do. Um, in the words of John Kenneth Galbraith, um, price controls can buy time. So what they can do is that if you are in a situation where supply is not forthcoming because, for example, the port in Long Beach is blocked and sh ships can just not enter the port, which means there's a physical barrier for supply to reach consumers. Or you have imposed the most um, wide-ranging economic sanctions in recent history, which means that a lot of stuff cannot be supplied because there's a political barrier that is you may not supply that stuff. In these kind of situations, if prices shoot up, supply does not adjust because you have um, reasons that prevent supply from adjusting that have nothing to do with the price level. In these kind of situations, it can be useful to put limits on how much the price can explode. This doesn't even mean a total price control at the pre-crisis level, but you might not want the price to go up three, four, five, six, seven times. You might want it to just go up by 30% or so, so that you can mobilize some of the stuff that might still be lying around in, in your warehouses, and that this meets the market, but you don't need to basically price everybody out of the market. Now, if you control the price and you don't do anything about the port to become unblocked um, or uh, 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 supplies that would have come uh, from the regions that are now under sanction to come from other kinds of sources, then your price control is not going to help you in any way with your inflation problem. That's why you then need fiscal policy kind of instruments. But I would think of these as absolutely complementary. Price controls can buy time to implement the kind of measures that solve the actual problem that you're facing. Thank you. I do love the idea of a price license for Heltner's control amp. That's <laughs> only in the German speaking world would you come up with such a brilliant concept. Next. Yeah, I will add to that. There is a novel by Ahmed Hamdi Tambunar uh, from 1961 it's called uh, Time Regulation Institute. Uh, it fits perfect well to this. I have a very short question. The recent uh, full nationalization of the French government of the EDF, uh, Electricity de France, uh, I don't still know the background, but is this a signal to that we take macroeconomic steps to somehow stabilize the market, especially electricity prices? Who wants to go for that one? Is this the leading edge of nationalization or a last ditch attempt to avoid bankruptcy? Or both, I mean, why choose? I think uh, it's difficult to say, but there is definitely more, more of this happening. I think actually there was more of this happening also with the, with the previous crisis. So we, we saw that in many countries, for example, there was an inverted trend also in, uh, in, uh, in bank, even bank ownership, even in the banking sector, there seemed to be that sector that uh, would have never been, uh, uh, would have never had uh, more government participation. So there, there are these trends. Um, and I think uh, indeed we see, we are seeing also with the example that I was mentioning before that there is more 
uh, intervention by the state. And one example that goes beyond the, the sphere of, uh, of, uh, of advanced economies, for example, I was reading that also uh, in Lebanon, that now they're, they're being uh, influenced uh, uh, very harshly by, uh, by, the, by inflation, in particular in, in food prices, uh, because, because mostly because of the invasion of, uh, of Ukraine. Now they are diverting their, their, their trade, uh, of, in, in particular the import of, of wheat, while, while before it was uh, mainly driven by private companies. Now the state is actually taking uh, uh, action there and is, uh, for example, has signed recently a deal with India to import uh, wheat from, uh, from India, that wheat that wasn't, wasn't imported from, uh, uh, from before. So I think like, there are two of these things happening in parallel. One is the one that you mentioned. So there is more government involvement uh, in, a more stable, in a more stable direction. So with uh, indeed uh, nationalization or like uh, increase in general in government ownership in different sectors of the society, but also on the other hand in terms of uh, uh, policy, policy involvement, which can be more temporary. Please. Thank you. Thank you for this great panel, first of all. Um, I also have a question to Isabella. Um, I very much appreciate your point saying that the current inflation is, you know, very sector specific, maybe even subsector specific, and is therefore kind of a not only a macroeconomic phenomenon, but of course, on the other hand, it is an inherent distribution conflict because there are always winners and losers, and you also stress this in your work. And um, kind of my question is, was this or did this also play a role in the arguments that you faced when you proposed the, you know, the gas price gap together with Sebastian Dulin, this inherent distribution conflict? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. I mean, one of the things that we are seeing here is that price increases in specific goods have immediate distributional consequences. When the price of basic stuff goes up, that constitutes a very large share of the expenditures of poor households, this hits poor households much, much harder than it hits rich households, which is also a point why I found it rather cynical to say, if inflation is transitory, it doesn't matter. If your credit card is already maxed out um, before you were facing inflation, let alone before interest rates <laughs> on your credit card were increased, and now your bill for housing, food, and, um, uh, uh, and, and gas goes up by 30%, um, then you are basically in a situation where you have to make choices between housing, food, and gas, right? <laughs> um, so this is a situation that even if transitory is extremely harmful to poor households and has immediate consequences for the basic lived experience of, of these groups um, of populations. Now, to the gas price cap proposal that Sebastian and I um, presented, um, notably before the war in Ukraine, because already then we estimated that um, the impact of the increase in natural gas prices alone would cause a 2.5% increase in inflation in Germany, which means that the increase that was then already in the pipeline in terms of the increase in wholesale prices in gas prices alone was sufficient to not meet the ECB target, okay? Um, so the idea of this gas price cap was to basically secure um, the price of the basic consumption for households so that the basic, a basic amount of, of, of um, um, uh, kilowatt hours um, that households need um, based on estimates that we um, conducted would be price stabilized. The price for um, gas consumption beyond that would be the market price, so that you have basically a price step there. Now, interestingly, um, some economists <laughs> um, who criticized us very sharply um, for that proposal at the time have come up with an analogous uh, proposal, which is, however, regressive. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you can design these kind of price interventions in progressive or regressive ways. If you design in the way in which we did, um, households that are consuming more gas would have a higher average gas price because you would have a larger share that would be at the high market price. Now, the proposal is on the table right now is that basically you get a stabilized price for 80% of your consumption in the previous year, which means that if you are living in a villa and have a pool and uh, <laughs> um, maybe 10 big TVs and a Tesla, um, then you get uh, a much, much, much larger um, uh, uh, subsidy at the end of the day from the state for your electricity consumption. So choose your poison. It really never ceases to amaze. You know, just when you think you're not going to see something like that, 
<laughs> Here it goes again. <laughs> Next question. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting debate. Uh, I, uh, I have this question for all of you. Um, uh, because fr fr from what I understand, it seems that, you know, we are trying to, uh, uh, let's say, unpack the sources of inflation. And my impression is that the more we are able uh, to identify somehow the micro sources of inflation and therefore like sectorial sources of inflation, the better uh, it is in terms of avoiding uh, a macro uh, response which would be inherently uh, much more dangerous uh, for the economy. I have a, uh, uh, I was thinking, uh, does it make uh, any difference in the end to understand you know, these micro sources if through the mechanism of expectations, then uh, you cannot really control uh, how this spreads to, uh, to other sectors? Because in the end, what the central bank can do is just to make sure that this uh, uh, doesn't become anchored. So uh, I'm kind of confused because if we address specific sectors, this uh, uh, doesn't mean that then uh, this is not affecting others. Yeah, can you maybe elaborate a bit more on this? Thanks. Yeah, um, it's, it's a really great question. Um, and uh, I'll be interested to hear what Isabella has to say about it, given her work on the sort of micro causes. But it strikes me that a couple of things. So one is there is a, a real dominant belief in economics, obviously, that expectations are a huge part of this story. Um, and yes, of course, expectations matter. Um, but I think given what we've seen already in the current experience, it's nothing like the um, rational sort of timeless models that are often you know, uh, used in the sense of like inf inflation, expectations adapt immediately. So I think uh, one of Isab this proposal from Isabella to focus on sort of the micro causes, right, is one way to actually address the issue uh, of what's happening in the economy, in the real economy, uh, before you get sort of runaway panics that are, lead to sort of um, expectations changes and massive anchorings in other places, et cetera. I also think just the idea that central banks are in the business of managing expectations amongst the populace is like kind of crazy um, uh, for lots of reasons. And actually not true. Right, exactly. One of which is Mark's favorite story, right? Which is that nobody pays attention to central banks like on a regular basis, like which is of course we all know, right? Like when you go home and your family asks you, what do you do research on? And you say central banks, at least my family go, what? Yeah, so like it's just not, a, it's not, I don't think, a credible theory of um, managing the economy that the, J. Powell and, you know, Lagarde and Andrew Bailey are actually influencing what we all think day to day about prices and wages and things. So I think there's like one story which is just like, one thing to say about the current story, which is just, it doesn't make very much sense uh, or insofar as that is their job, they're not very good at it. And then another reaction, which is to say, if we actually have buttons or levers to addressing the core issues at a very specific level, then maybe this is something we're not even going to have to worry about um, uh, in, a, in a sort of serious way. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the metaphor is working? Yeah. yeah. Um, the metaphor that I used in that infamous Guardian piece um, was to say, if you have a fire in your kitchen, you don't want to put your whole border under, your whole house under water, right? So you want to put the fire out where it's starting to burn. If you let that fire burn <laughs> and it starts spreading across your house, then you could um, end up in a situation where it becomes very difficult to use targeted measures, right? That's why I did write that piece at the time when I did, because I felt it was like high time to step into the kind of specific, very important prices that were clearly spiraling out of control. Now, if you don't step in, you do get an expectation problem, I think, of a type that is not necessarily the one that we think about when we think about macroeconomic debates on expectation. Namely, firms tend to set prices not on a daily basis, at least not if you are talking about non-spot type of prices, but they set prices every so and so many 
months. So they set their prices in a way where they expect a certain trajectory for their input prices. And if they expect their input prices to triple or quadruple or um, increase five times, then they will price this into the stuff that they are selling. So there you have a very strong immediate channel in terms of expectations. If you actually end up being in a situation of very generalized, unanchored kind of inflation, almost hyperinflation, then I would argue, yes, expectations start to matter. If basically people start treating money like a hot potato, and once they get the money, they take it to the shop and <laughs> um, try to exchange it against actual goods as quickly as they can, then you, you do have an expectation problem. So clearly, this can happen, but I think it's a matter of the stage of the dynamic of an inflation, whether this is the key element or not. I just wanted to add one thing on this uh, on this inflation expectation uh, topic because so I think the, the interesting part is that indeed many economists do not worry too much about current inflation. The, the case of Krugman because he says okay, inflation expectations are so far like well anchored, like we don't see much much movement, not not the one that we would expect. And I think it's interesting because I have the impression that now the debate is a bit shifting, at least in central banks, because. Because the focus is shifting more fr from inflation expectation to the idea of public trust. So probably many of you have seen that in the literature now there, are, there, are, there is this emergence of a lot of uh, papers and works that look more at the trust in the central bank rather than inflation expectations. Because the idea there is that, okay, we have a strong trust to toward the central bank, and if trust is high, we tend also to better adapt our inflation expectations to the, to, the policy, to the policy change. That would be the idea, and that's why central banks are investing a lot now in new survey data, databases. I'm currently using one for, for, the, for the ECB because, because they want to know a bit, a bit more what, what, is, what is going on, and there are new pilot uh, uh, survey on, the, on this topic. However, the point is that, and here like I'm referring to one of uh, Mark's favorite uh, papers like, uh, on, based on New Zealand, like you notice that uh, people might uh, have their expectations quite well anchored, but at the same time, it's not necessarily true that it's because they, they trust uh, the central bank. There is, yeah, trust in the central bank, but then they don't know who the central bank governor is or what the objective is of the central bank. They don't even know that the objective is price stability, even in an environment like New Zealand where uh, inflation targeting actually started. So there are a lot of uh, interesting factors, and I think one direction that could uh, give us an answer on this topic is that actually public trust over the central bank depends a lot on economic conditions. Like now I'm working on, for example, on the topic of inequality. I think if you are in a good position in the income distribution, you tend to trust more the central bank and then also be more relaxed in terms of your inflation expectations. So this could be, for example, a factor that is, uh, that is particularly uh, important. And this also correlates uh, trust over the central bank with trust toward other institutions. So I trust the central bank because in general I trust the system. So. You going back in? Yes, Go sorry, I, I wanted to make one more point on the expectations. I think that from the perspective of, in, of consumers, inflation expectations are much more driven by the perceived increase in essential prices, what they think will happen to food prices, gas prices, and housing, <laughs> and some other key prices that are ha weighing very heavily in, in consumers' baskets rather than by the um, central bank um, interest rate. Another quick point, um, since Krugman has been in, in, invoked several times, I think it's always important to uh, make sure which vintage of Krugman you are referring to. Since Krugman of April 2020 was in favor of selective price controls, Krugman of December 2021 thought they were truly stupid. They all, he also thought that corporate profits um, had nothing to do with inflation. Krugman of 2022 July thinks that corporate profits are a pretty important factor in inflation. <laughs> so I think we want to make sure um, which group may we are referring to. Thank you. And uh, just to jump in really quick on that last point, too, that Isabella made about what's actually driving consumer expectations, you know, and it being things like food and energy, to, to reference some of her current research, which I just heard about, um, about is about figuring out, you know, what's really driving inflation. And I think it's a, a, a beautiful thing to focus on things like food and energy when we have central banks focusing on core inflation, which explicitly doesn't take into account food and energy, which are the prices that matter most to most households, particularly poor households. So you just think, I'm sorry, you're in charge of maintaining price stability to supposedly benefit my life, but you don't care about the things that are influencing my life in a dominant way. And I said I wasn't going to talk, but I have to jump in on this one just quickly. Uh, Bank of France surveys, exactly the same thing. They changed the survey, apparently. 
uh, because they were doing something similar to what the Fed did, which is we don't put housing in, but we put in owner's equivalent rent, which no one can understand. And then we put a massive discount on it so it doesn't really show up in the index. And of course, this is populist dynamite because if you're actually walking, you know, talking to someone who really hurts because house prices and rents are constantly going up, you say, yeah, but we don't count that as inflation. It's like, well, why not? Well, because we do owner's equivalent rent and then discount it. It really sounds like you're cooking the books. It really does. And that, that's, that's, I think that's the ways in which sort of expectations matter, but in a very different way from what we normally model. I, I agree. And just one last thing is that, to again, to Elizabeth, Isabel's point about the difference in prices is, of course, then there's the represent, representative basket, right, that's supposed to give us the picture of what inflation is across the country. But if you actually think about who is it representing, right? You know, there's like a sick person's basket looks very different to an older person's basket, looks very different to a new parent's basket, looks different in Alaska than it does in West Virginia, et cetera, and so on. I mean, it's as if it's, you know, to try and get uh, figure out what to do about um, specific regional experiences of climate, right? We're looking at the temperature of the US overall, like, and what is that actually telling us about people's experiences? Yeah, I have. <laughs> So it's quite a question you've asked. Obviously, uh, a pet issue of mine, so I have to latch on to that. Um, so I think it's important here to realize that it's not only the case that these baskets are different, but it's also the case that in the baskets of people who are rich, there are things that are actually going down in price if the prices of essentials are going up. Let me give you um, an example that comes from a conversation with my mom um, as a housewife uh, who has been uh, operating on a very tight budget for a long time. As she was pointing out to me, um, when she goes to the shop and she ends up feeling that she cannot buy more than eggs, bread, and milk, and she leaves the shop, and all of these things have increased in price by 30%, and her neighbor, who has more money, ends up also buying a bottle of champagne and uh, uh, 500 grams of um, strawberries, and the price of strawberries has gone down by 35%, and the price of champagne has gone down by 40%, then that person's average increase in expenditure is much, much lower than the increase in expenditure of that housewife who is on a tight budget. So this is an effect um, that, that is huge, um, and that is not being talked about at all. Um, and that, ha that, that is why I'm saying, like, which prices go up have immediate redistributive consequences. That's why if we construct CPI measures for different income groups, we, we get very different kinds of, um, of levels. Is it on already? Yeah, okay, cool. Um, thank you so much. Let me connect to Maxine's questions on redistribution and ask on a more international level, uh, what are the channels that we should have to talk about price controls, not only on national, like, core countries levels, but to exactly ease in um, food price increases and energy price increases on a more international level and have these kind of interventions? Thank you. Um. Yes, uh, this is actually, this goes back to the nationalization question that came up earlier, um, where rich countries have the possibility to nationalize electricity providers and basically um, transfer the costs of the inputs into electricity <laughs> into these nationalized units and subsidize them through fiscal tools and thereby basically absorb um, the very high increase in oil and gas prices. Poor countries typically don't have the ability to do that because they still have to buy gas and oil on the world market. And for them, interest rates are going up by even more than they are for rich countries, as we all know um, very well, which means that for them, the situation is actually even more dramatic, which is a reason why I think that the current initiatives that we have seen at the G7 to stabilize um, the price of gas and oil on an international level basically um, through some sort of a bias cartel, not in the sense of buying, um, and, and I mean, not a cartel that actually organizes the buying, but a cartel where rich countries agree that they will not buy oil and gas above a certain price that is, to be sure, a price that is still far above the pre-crisis level, right? So all of your green implications and so on, you already have because the price is already off the charts, but you don't let it explode further, which I think would have very important um, positive implications for the global south, since 
these players, I mean, we know that they are consuming most of CO2 in the world and so on. This also means that they are the biggest buyers of this stuff. <laughs> it also means that if these big, powerful economies um, get together and um, agree to not pay a higher price than that, then this would bring the international price down and would have important benefits um, for Global South countries. I think something similar is urgently needed for food, where the situation has been even more severe. And, um, of course, we know that Global South countries tend to produce um, cash crops that are for export, which are the kind of goods um, that are A, super volatile in their price on the global market. So yes, all the proposals that Caldo and Keynes already made after the war and for stabilization of exactly these prices are still super timely, mm -hmm. but also B, that they tend to not produce enough of the staple kind of food items that they need to feed their people, <laughs> which means that they are even more um, even more vulnerable to these um, exploding international food prices. So that's why I think this, this, I mean, the question of global food and fuel price stabilization for the sake of the global south should be very, very high up on the agenda. I'll just jump in really briefly uh, just to say, to connect this point to an earlier point, right, about... Um, and emphasize the importance of time here, right, and the justifications for certain policies. So there's a classic economic approach to policymaking that is driven by essentially the concept that the long run uh, will come, right? The equilibrium will come, and we can sort of survive the volatility in the meantime. And so, you know, if it's a sort of basic Caldor Hicks view of the world, right? We, we, you know, something occurs, but it's fine because in the end, we have more resources and we can redistribute to make sure everyone is whole and better off in the end. But what Isabella has just emphasized here in the international sphere, and we were talking about earlier with inflation costs, is there, <laughs> first of all, we all know that just doesn't happen, right? The redistribution doesn't end up happening in the end to make people whole and make them better off. So not everyone is better off. But even more than that, there are just things that happen that you cannot compensate for, right? So what about all the people that, because of you know not having uh, immediate policy uh, resolutions and, and, and action taken in light of COVID? What about people that died? What about people who lost their homes? You know, like that's not something that the state can fix, even if it wants to. And so this idea of um, it all comes out in the wash, kind of, and it's best for everyone if we just kind of hold on and have the optimal policy taken, you know, justified over sort of give and take of positive and negatives over the long run. I think we need to start really fast moving away from and think about what do we need to do right now? No, a simple way of thinking about that perhaps is we usually assume that shocks are independent and normally distributed, and they're not. So like, just start there. They're basically not, they're extremely kurtotic and they're all related to each other and compound each other, in which case you cannot mean revert to an equilibrium because there is no equilibrium to mean revert to. That's why Kaido wrote Economics Without equ Equilibrium, right? Just in defense of one of my favorite economists here. <laughs> Anyone else? We're approaching the end of time. Not really, because that's yeah. Okay, um, my question is also go yes. going to the solutions. Like in, in Germany, there's a, a, a restart or revival of the concerted action, which is... Um, a uh, round table of uh, government, uh, employers, and employees, uh, so, uh, um, trade unions. And um, yeah, I, I wanted to ask, like, what uh, could they uh, achieve uh, in, in your assessment, uh, Isabella? And given also that the history of the first concerted action was more like um, government and um, uh, employers' unions trying to exert pressure on trade unions to have wage restraints, and um, do you think this is a solution? And, um, and also related to that is, uh, what does this mean like for the corporatist model of, of, of Germany going forward? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I have spent quite a bit of time talking to unions in Germany, and I cannot speak for them, but I can share, I think, that there's a very clear sentiment that the kind of price increases that we see are completely out of reach in any kind of wage negotiation. So even if there will be very strong wage increases, um, they will not compensate for the price increases that we have seen, which means that a real distribution has already happened, right? Which is, I think, part of the reason why the IG Metall, the most 
um, powerful, I would say, um, union in Germany that represent metal and heavy industries and machinery and so on, um, endorsed the proposal that we um, put forward in February early on. And in fact, the the DGP, the German, how do you say in, in English? Oh my God, the German umbrella organization of, of unions, Federation, Federation of Unions, <laughs> yeah. um, also endorsed our proposal um, because I think they are aware that one has to do something about these very important prices because if they go off the charts, they cannot catch them through rate negotiations. What should be done? Um, I think that, first of all, we have to think of this not in terms of, oh, if we do A, then we should not be doing B. If we do something about prices, then we should not do transfer measures. If we do something about prices, we still have to do transfer measures for those who have already been hit very hard, okay? Just to get that out of the way. I'm not against transfer measures. At the same time, I do not think that transfer measures will be enough to contain this inflation because transfer measures enable people to pay higher prices. They don't bring prices down. Um, the most important the important price by far in the German context is the gas price. This was already the case before the war in Ukraine and it's even more the case now. So what I've been working on with colleagues at the German Institute for Economic Research and at the um, Institute for Macroeconomic Research are proposals um, that, that so far haven't been integrated into a package, but that would be the package that I would emphasize which is first a stabilization of the wholesale gas price on the EU level, ideally in collaboration with other G7 countries. Second, a um, gas saving plan on the EU level that we have proposed back in April, um, which would be based of, on principles of coordination across countries and principles of um, a, a target sack setting where these targets would be set based on a broad um, uh, consultation of stakeholders such as labor unions, but also all sorts of other important stakeholders, um, including business, of course, but also civil society and so on, so that you have clear targets that you can then work towards, um, which is basically um, uh, inspired by what happened in South Africa, where there was a water shortage and they were like trying to um, overcome the water shortage by all sorts of voluntary calls, like, please, people, save some more water, and nothing happened. And then eventually, they um, re reverted to that kind of concerted action with very clear target setting, where everybody could have a sense of how they're contributing to these targets, and it ended up working. Will this work in the case of gas? We don't know. Is it the best shot that we have? Um, I do think so, <laughs> because if we, if we don't do that kind of thing, what we get um, is, is um, a chaotic kind of rationing that will happen if there are shortages. The current emergency plans are such that um, business would be shut off first, which um, might sound progressive and nice, but it's completely unrealistic, I think, if we're dealing with shortages that uh, are sustained over months rather than shortages that are um, due to maintenance or that kind of thing, which is for which the, the case for which these emergency plans have been designed. This means that there will have to be some sort of a distribution of burden sharing. And I think if there is not a process that is based on principles of fairness and participation on the EU level, if this happens in a chaotic way, we can be fairly sure who wins <laughs> in that kind of process and who doesn't. In these kind of situations of shock and chaos, it's typically the strong um, uh, 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 elements in society that, that are able to, to, um, to, to push through their interests as opposed to labor unions, unemployed, retired people, students, <laughs> um, southern European countries, <laughs> and so on, right? Um, as regards, so if you had such a coordinated saving pr uh, program, a stabilized wholesale gas price, and then you had the kind of um, price insurance for the basic consumption of households at a level that takes off some of the pressure that people have already experienced with inflation and basically also ensures that the lowered wholesale prices are passed on to consumers at the very least for the basic needs of people um, while still maintaining the incentives to save because you have these high marginal prices. I think you would be still trying to weather for a very big storm and it's still going to be tough, but I think you would be better prepared than with many of the other proposals that um, at the end of the day rely on exploding prices and very will probably result in ad hoc unfair rationing, which I think will have huge social and political implications because if people fear that they are sitting in the cold, <laughs> um, they, they get very angry. I think it's entirely clear that this is what, what, what will happen if there's no process to contain this. <laughs>
I believe we have two more in four minutes. Go right ahead. Okay, uh, so thank you so much uh, to all of you for, for this amazing conversation. Uh, it's been really great to hear. Um, and I just want to say that I come from a country that has price controls from at least a decade, and the inf annual inflation rate is 70%. So prices don't feel really controlled, I would argue. Um, and so I totally buy the argument that price controls allow you to buy time, but then you have to put in place at the same time some uh, structural uh, policies. But I feel that sometimes we are stuck a bit in the price control conversation when, and we don't really discuss then what are those uh, structural policies that we have to put in place which are as equally important at least if not more than price control uh, themselves. So I want to ask you what do you think these structural policies are in this context and also uh, perhaps uh, insinuating a bit my own opinion is that traditional demand uh, macro policies are not the way to go. We really need structural, uh, you know, industrial policy, supply side intervention, and even nationalization and direct state production investment, increases in productivity in the sectors that, whose prices are, are going up. But I just wanted to ask you what do you think and then, yeah, maybe push that forward. Yeah, thank you. Um, sorry, I think this is a question for me. <laughs> um, Yes, so, I mean, this is one of the points that was frequently invoked in this uh, rather absurd price control storm. It so happens that in my book I have a whole chapter on the Chinese hyperinflation where I'm contrasting the Chinese hyperinflation of the 1930s and 40s with the experience of price stabilization in the Second World War. And I'm arguing very explicitly um, that um, basically for the same reasons that price controls worked in the United States, they did not work in China. Um, and these reasons are that, to quote again John Kenneth Galbraith, it's relatively easy to fix prices that are already fixed. If you are dealing with prices that are set by large um, industrial conglomerates, where you basically have a price administrator that is sitting somewhere setting prices, um, then it's relatively easy to come up with a political consultation process where this specific price setting is not only in the interest of the corporation, but where there are some other interests represented in this conscious price setting process. This also means that prices that are not fixed are very difficult to fix. And in fact, that also happened in the United States where it was much more difficult to set the prices in agriculture where you had many, many dispersed small um, producers than to set the prices of stuff like steel. Now, in the Chinese case, in the 30s and 40s, you had the same people, people like Leon Henderson, who was the Tsar of prices in the United States, come to China, advise the nationalists, advise them on the same principles that they had used in the United States, it had worked pretty well there, and they failed dramatically. Why did they fail? Because the basic market integration in China had broken. This is an, a more extreme case of bottlenecks, if you want so, where basically all the channels of, 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 um, of commerce between the urban and the rural economy were no longer working. So if you now issued a, a currency for which you could basically not buy the stuff that you wanted to buy, <laughs> what most people wanted to buy, then basically this currency was worthless. Whether someone was um, issuing a, a command that, um, that, that prices should be whatever they should be or not, the currency at the end of the day could not buy the stuff that people wanted to buy. So what the communists did, which was absolutely crucial in winning the civil war, um, and in fact, they stabilized prices at a pace that was entirely unexpected by the CIA, CIA and the communists themselves, <laughs> um, was to establish um, state commercial agencies that basically in the first step recreated market links and ensured that farmers that were producing stuff in the countryside had channels of commerce to actually supply this stuff in the urban economy and that the stuff that was being produced in the urban economy could actually be supplied in the countryside. <laughs> and through these kind of methods, um, ultimately managed to ensure that the currencies that the communists were issuing were able to buy stuff because they made sure that this stuff could be bought and thus the prices in their areas were more stable than in the prices um, than in the areas controlled by the nationalists which meant that in that sense ironically the nationalists relied on 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 more kind of command and order price controls and the communists relied on market based <laughs> um, stabilization and i think this is to illustrate that the that prices at the end of the day 
are not the kind of homogeneous um, variable that economists like to make them appear, where you have supply and demand curves, and it's like just moving in that magical fashion, but rather that the ways in which prices move is extremely contextual, extremely historical, and requires an extraordinary amount of understanding of the specific institutional, technical, and structural um, situation that you are facing, which is the reason, by the way, why in this um, OPED, I did not include any specific examples for sectors, because I believe that to work out policies for specific sectors, you have to talk to experts who really understand the structures of these sectors. And for the stuff that I've done on the gas market, I have been collaborating with colleagues who have been working on the gas market for many, many, many years, right? This goes back to the question of corporatism. I actually think that the institutions in the German case of corporatism could be used as institutions that have specifically that kind of sectoral technology technological knowledge, because the union representative that sits on the board of BMW knows pretty well how, how the automobile um, industry works. So the, we have that kind of expertise in a sense, but it hasn't been tapped into for the question of, of, of price civilization. Lee, the last word. Yeah, thank you. Um, just very quickly, I mean, one quick thought, and like one way of emphasizing this point that Isabella just made uh, is about, it's just we forget, right, that people set prices, right? We talk about markets determining prices, but it's through the interaction of existing prices. So people are determining those things. So particularly in certain industries, going to talk to those people to figure out why they're setting prices in the way that they are or negotiating with them, if you're the state, about setting them differently seems like a very obvious way to go. But the second point um, to your question, which is a fantastic one, I think it's it's extremely revealing, right? So why one reason I think why price controls are often sort of dismissed is because there's this idea that that second step, that essential second step of what do you do with the time that you're buying seems infeasible, right? Because we live in this situation of just extreme monetary dominance. So the central bank would have to say to the fiscal authority, yeah, okay, go ahead and do that. We'll let you do that. I mean, there was a question this morning at Paul Tucker's uh, talk, which was essentially, you know, shouldn't the central bank be more explicitly saying to the fiscal authority, um, yeah, we're going to support you, we're going to back you up, you go and do some spending, we, we're, we're, um, we're accepting of that. But isn't, aren't we already in an upside down world, in a topsy-turvy world, in which the central bank is giving permission to the legislature to go and make policy, right? So I think that's part of this all runs together, right? That's part of the issue. We have to be in a world, we have to be in a governance regime in which the fiscal authority, the legislature, can take those steps. And I think that runs us right back into this issue of monetary dominance and central bank independence. And we're at 10 minutes too, so we're four minutes past. Do you want to, it's, it's your schedule, dude. Do you want to stay on it or do you want to blow it? It's up to you. But then it devalues the currency. <laughs> we'll have you. one more at the back. Thank you. Just on your comment, I think a number of central banks have said, specifically have said in the, in the last years that we will support fiscal, uh, fiscal spending. So they might be independent in theory, but not in practice. Um, I've got two quick questions. Um, Actually, one, one, one. Um, I was at a dinner last night. Thank you. It was great. And one of the colleagues there said that something that I have been thinking about uh, for a long time. And I've written on conflict inflation. And what he has said uh, made a lot of sense that for him, and I agree, all inflation is conflict driven. Even at the international level, oil producing companies are imposing a claim on uh, the international GDP, you know, output or something. So uh, there's no such thing as demand-driven inflation, and there's no such thing as, you know, cost-driven or, or, you know, it, we should all see it as conflict inflation. Certain groups trying to uh, take away a certain uh, a portion of the pie, and, inf and that means that it's all about income distribution. I just wanted to know if it changes any of your ideas if you see all inflation as being conflict-driven. Everybody gets one minute, and you all have to answer. Go. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, 
the quick answer is yes. I think it's very clear that all inflation is conflict driven. The the demand and supply side, insofar as that is a useful sort of descriptor, comes from who has the power at that moment, right? So and and who who is able to sort of get their way in that instance uh, in terms of um, benefits from from the price level. And so. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, it's all distributional, right? People are trying to, everyone in the economy is trying to earn income and gain wealth and figure out how to supply for their family and, and, and you know, their lives. And the question is, who is winning? Who has the power to do that? It's all conflict-driven. And then the central bank is supposed to uh, mediate that conflict, so to, so to speak. And the way in which it's done has been done in the recent past is just, in my opinion, quite obviously on on one side more than the other. So I think that's a fine way to, to uh, understand it, but I'm not sure it, it changes the picture um, very much. Yeah, um, great question. This actually um, allows me to make a point that I wanted to make on the very first question that we had, which was, why inflation now, right? Like, why is it the case that we have been living through decades of deflation or relatively stable inflation, by the way, we tend to forget the inflationary episode from 2007, 2008, but in any case, overall picture, relatively stable kind of inflation regime, whereas then suddenly we find ourselves in this explosion of inflation, right? And one of the elements that one can use to explain this dynamic um, is, I think, corporate behavior and the development of profits. Now, some people have tried to argue that the increase in profits is a result of the increase in corporate concentration in the pandemic. I do think that corporate concentration has increased in the pandemic because of the power dynamic that has played out um, in, in the ways in which the pandemic evolved. However, I do not think that an increase in corporate concentration was necessary to make the point that corporate profits are part of um, the, the explanation of why we have inflation. By the way, I'm very consciously emphasizing here part of, because I don't think it's the only explanation, but I think it's an important element that we have to take seriously. Now, why is it the case that in the pre-pandemic world, competition between gigantic corporations that control a handful of these types of corporations controls whole sectors more or less globally, played out in a way that we saw stable prices or even falling prices. And after the pandemic, we find ourselves in a world where these same corporations, same players, same structure um, end up checking up prices. The reason is, I think, that the dynamic of competition has changed. And that goes back to conflict in the sense that competition between corporations, I would think, is one of the most important forms of conflict in a capitalist economy. Before the pandemic, with just-in-time supply chains, competition was such that if demand went up, these gigantic corporations were competing over who gets the largest share in the cake, who gets the lar largest market share, by absorbing that kind of demand, which meant that they kept the prices more or less stable, but they could mobilize these just-in-time international production networks, where they could, from today to tomorrow, say, 5,000 more Bangladeshian workers in my factory, <laughs> and then they could have T-shirts um, at your doorsteps, thanks to Amazon, three days later, which means that you had a competition that was not less fierce, not less concentrated, but that operated through the delivery of quantities and ever more appealing products um, to consumers. After the pandemic, corporations didn't get more greedy either. They have always been greedy. They have always tried to maximize profits. That's what big corporations do. But the dynamic of competition changed in the sense that this just-in-time delivery was no longer possible. So when demand went up, and I am Honda and you are Toyota, and I know that I cannot deliver more Hondas, and I know that if I cannot deliver more Hondas, Toyota can also not deliver more Toyotas, then I might as well increase the price because I know that my customers cannot simply go to Toyota and instead buy a Toyota and I've lost um, my Honda driver to Toyota. But instead, we have switched from a dynamic of competition um, where quantity adjusts to demand to a dynamic of competition where corporations basically had a coordination mechanism through the sector-wide bottlenecks that allowed them to increase prices without 
having to fear that they're losing market shares to their competitors. Final word, okay. <laughs> uh, yes, I agree. I think inflation is, uh, is, the, is the product of a conflict. And I think this is something that we can see also in uh, standard economic theory. I think it's a very, like the Phillips curve is a very <laughs> elegant way to hide this, uh, or to describe in the end, like this, uh, this conflict between uh, uh, companies, capital, and, uh, and uh, workers, in, the, in particular uh, as trade unions. And I think that's why also it doesn't work today as it was working in the past, because today trade unions are weaker, Workers are in a weaker position than they were in the past compared to companies. And this is why, for example, uh, we don't see the same, the same reactions that we would expect between, uh, between, wages, uh, between wages and inflation. And I think this leads us to a very important question. I guess it's an open question. That is, uh, uh, who is actually going to lose from, uh, from inflation? Who are going to be the losers of inflation? What could be the political and social consequences of the creation of this new pool of, uh, of, uh, of people, of individuals that, that will lose from that. And I mean, also here, like we could uh, believe the standard theory that uh, inflation is uh, indeed distributional and uh, it advantages some, it, advan it's, it's, uh, it's, it has positive consequences on debtors uh, and, uh, and bad for creditors, but then debtors tend to be low income individuals that struggle because they see their purchasing power being eroded. So it's not that easy to identify these people, but definitely we know that there are gonna be many losers, and this will depend also on the size of the policy reaction that uh, will be implemented. So how big will be this interest rate hike, whether we are gonna create a crisis, as some suggest, I don't think that's the right solution, but some people suggest that this is the case. But if we're gonna create a crisis, and if we're gonna have huge unemployment, and we are gonna have people that not only lose their jobs, but also lose their purchasing power, what are going to be the political consequences of this? And probably we will have, uh, if we, if in, this, in this very bad uh, uh, context, like a, a new rise uh, of uh, populism, definitely a new rise uh, of uh, anti-establishment uh, sentiments against the incumbent. Uh, and, uh, and so the, the, actual, the, actual th the actual problem is that we may end up with societies that are even more polarized than they are right now. And on that happy note, <laughs> thank you all for joining the panel.